perspective is? Everything. Perspective is? Everything. Perspective is? Everything. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. And Jesus himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping. See, the equipping. equipping. For the equipping of the saints. And let's get this down here. For the work of ministry. For the work of ministry. See, ministry is work. Ministry is work. work. Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. (laughs) For the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. So remember, there are many ways that we can be equipped for ministry, all very valid ways to be equipped for ministry. But that doesn't mean that we're always fully prepared for ministry. Anyway, glory to God. So we're, we're not always fully prepared for ministry, and particularly, I believe, a ministry that is a continuation of Jesus' ministry. See, it's time for ministry. It's time for ministry. Time or a continuation of Jesus' ministry. Mm-hmm. And perspective is? Everything. Perspective is? Everything. everything. Hallelujah. See, when it, in a, with a Jesus' ministry, you never know what you're going to be facing. You know, if you're, just in, if you're just in the traditional, let's just, you know, do it the way it's always been done, then you know exactly what's going to happen next, pretty much. You know, and if something out of that happens, everybody's like, oh! You know, a, a demon shows up in church or something, you know? A demon starts crying out, ah, you know, and, and, and everybody's like, oh, get the children out, get everybody out, oh, hey, let's get out of here, fire the animals up, you know. <laughs> That's what happened to the Jesus ministry. You know, straight after Jesus had been back to Nazareth and they'd kicked him out, or he'd go out, he was, they were going to throw him over a cliff, remember, and he, I'm sure he was thinking, what in the world's happening here? But anyway, he took off through the midst of them, and the next way he's down the road and he's teaching in other synagogues, in other towns and cities, and then in one place he goes, there's a man, a demon starts screaming out, Jesus just says, be quiet, be quiet, come out of him in the name of Jesus. The man shook a little bit, fell over, and the demon left, and that was it, let's go on with the job. Hallelujah. Ministry is work. Amen. Supernatural work. The work of God's kingdom. Hallelujah. Jesus wasn't going to let some demon wreck his, wreck his uh, sermon. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. He might not have been, I mean, some of us might not have been fully prepared for that, but we need to be prepared for that. Because that's the sort of stuff that happens in a Jesus ministry. Mm-hmm. Amen. It doesn't happen in religious church that often. Amen. But it happens in a Jesus ministry. Glory to God. Remember the first time? Well, I won't go down that road anyway. I'll give you a few testimonies on that one if you like. Anyway, save that for later. <laughs> ministry is work. Yeah. Revelation chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. I read these, these, verse, this, these verses um, the last time. and They just kind of gripped me. And, I mean, and so I just want to read them again. Uh, Jesus speaking here through... Uh, the Apostle John through to the church in Sardis. In Revelation 2, 3, verses 2 to 3. Wake up! Turn that person and say, wake up! Wake up, wake up. <laughs> wake up strengthen what remains, and is about to die. You know, I, I believe that this is so relevant for the church right now. Who knows when your alarm goes off first thing in the morning, what do you normally do? What do you do? Snooze. You, snooze, <laughs> snooze. You know, the alarm's going off. The alarm is saying, wake up! It's time to get up! And what do you want to do? Hit that snooze button. Yep. How many times you hit it? Come on, let's... Oh, oh. <laughs> how many times does it let you? <laughs> well, I believe this is what's happening. God is speaking to the church right now and he's saying, wake up! Wake up! You need to wake up to what's going on all around you. And what are we doing? Oh, where's that? Oh, hit that snooze button. You ever hit the other button by mistake? You thought you hit snooze? Yep. Then an hour later you go, oh no, oh no, what's happening, oh no, look at the time, oh my god, oh no, no. All of a sudden your whole morning is in chaos. Yeah. Everything, you're like, oh, so everything's out of sync from there on. Well, God is saying, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your works, so this is what I want us to catch this morning, I have found your works unfinished. I have found your works unfinished in the sight of of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Remember therefore. That, that's, I love that word remember. It's, a, it's, it's the most powerful covenant word. Remember. That's all we have to do. Remember. Remember. Glad if you don't remember you forget. Glad if you forget you don't remember. And there are certain things we need to be always have at the forefront of our minds. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. See, God has, God has been teaching us. God has been establishing us. God has been helping us. He's been putting his word into us. And if you don't remember what his word says when you come up against some, some situation that you've been equipped for, but hang on, you're not prepared for it. Why? Because you forgot what you were equipped with. God has equipped us for every situation and every circumstance. 
Amen. All we have to do is remember what we have received and heard and hold it fast and repent. If we've let go of it, if we've let it slip a little bit, if we've we've begun to discount a little bit, I yeah, you don't need to worry about that or bother about that. But you see, if you don't wake up, Jesus says, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come. We've just been singing, he's coming again, but for some people he's going to come like a thief at a time when they're not expecting this uh, straight from Scripture. He says he'll come... For some people, he will come at a time when they're not expecting him, and they'll be they'll be caught unawares. Hallelujah! And unfinished works. I have found your works unfinished. Let's listen, listen to Jesus' testimony uh, from a few scriptures here. John chapter four, verse thirty-four. Jesus said to them, "My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. Yeah. To finish." His work. John chapter 5 verse 36. But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. John 17 verse 4. Jesus praying to the Father. Coming to the end of his, of his ministry. Time on this earth. He says I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me. To do then, of course, John 19, verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. You know, he had to give it up. <laughs> and I think in the Amplified it says, He voluntarily gave up his spirit. So it would appear that Jesus obviously placed the utmost importance on finishing the work that he had been sent to accomplish. Jesus has finished his work. But he speaks to this church in Sardis. He said, I have not found your works. I found your works to be unfinished. So it seems like they stopped short of finishing the work that they had been given to do. They, had, they were, like many of us do from time to time, we rest in our laurels. We, we talk about what we've done. Rather than, we think most of the time about what we've done, we testify most of the things about what we've done. Rather than about examining what we've still to do. It seems that, that, that Jesus also viewed the finishing of the work that he committed to us to be of similar importance to the finishing of the work that he had been given. John 20, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Shalom to you. What's Jesus is communicating something very powerful to them here. He said to them, You will have everything that you will ever need. I am sending you, but be anxious for nothing. Don't be afraid or worried or concerned about anything that you encounter because I have already provided everything that you will ever need to get the job done. It's already been provided. I have finished my work. Now it's time for you to get on and finish your work. And everything that you will ever need to finish that work has been provided. You will have everything you will ever need. Nothing missing, nothing broken. You will be fully equipped with everything you need in order to finish the work that I have commissioned you for. Peace to you. Shalom to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. As I said last time, if you remember, I tried to kind of rush through that and, and kind of but uh, Jesus was born fully equipped. Amen? He was he he all of the immutables that we talk about, you know, he, he were established in him from birth. He was born righteous. He was born healed. He was born delivered. He was born prosperous. He was born untainted in any way by any manifestation of the curse. And all I want you to hear this. All he had to do was live the life. All he had to do was live the life as the Righteous, the healed, the delivered, the prosperous. No manifestation of the curse ever evident in his life. John chapter 1 verses 45 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He came and he said, this is, this is the life that God intends for you. Yeah. Righteous, healed, delivered, prosperous, everything that you'll ever need at hand every time, in every situation, in every circumstance. It says in verse 5, And the light shines in the darkness. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend or did not overcome it. But who knows, after 30 years of living basically in, in, in full possession of all of these uh, uh, foundational realities, really in a very low-key and very low-impact manner, 
Well, why can you say that? Because nobody really noticed. That's it. After that, Jesus is baptized in water. The Father says it's now time to step on the center stage. He's baptized in water. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. He is led by the Spirit into the wilderness for a 40-day period of fasting that culminates in an encounter with the darkness and all of the, all of the subtle attempts of the accuser to infiltrate and to compromise him. But Jesus, who is the Word of God in the flesh, emerges from that time of testing completely victorious. Mm -hmm. Completely victorious. And he comes out of the wilderness in the power. He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness and he comes out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And everything changes dramatically. Mm. As he launches out into public ministry and as, but please hear us, and as out of the message, does this sound familiar? Out of the message the ministry comes. <laughs> John 14 verse 11 to 13 Believe me, Jesus says, that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So easy to pass over verses like that, but they're just so jam-packed full of everything that, <laughs> that everybody out there needs. <laughs> Amen. P please listen here with your spirit. Don't try and filter this through all of this stuff right now. Just listen with your spirit, and from your spirit, let it come and change your mind. Hallelujah. Everything that we have had laid in us as a foundation, all of the things we've spent years just trying to lay this foundation, the immutables, the, 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 we're not the sinner trying to get righteous, we're, the, we are now, we're born again as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, with power and authority in Jesus' name to say no to sin, Jesus, just like Jesus did there in that wilderness and carried, like he did for 30 years prior to that. We're not the sick trying to get healed, the churches run around as sick trying to get healed. But we were, we were born again healed. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to try and get healed. You're not supposed to uh, pray for people to get healed. You're supposed to speak healing to them. You will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Not try and pray some flowery religious prayer that covers up the, the failure you're expecting. <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to pray this massive prayer that's some kind of uh, small print in case it doesn't work. <laughs> Sometimes the longer the prayer, the smaller the print. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the less the impact. Sometimes I hear the longer the prayer, the less faith there is in that prayer. Jesus did not pray long prayers. In fact, he had something to say about long prayers. All of these things that God has established in us were not the, the, the praise trying to get delivered, glory to God, or any of that other stuff. All of these things are things that Jesus was born with. But none of us had any of these things naturally. None of us. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. This time from above. You must be born again from above. Just like Jesus. Mary, the, the, the angel Gabriel showed up in Mary's house and said... And told her what was going to happen in her life. She's like, how could that possibly ever happen? How could I have a child? I've never known a man. He said, well, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And that which is conceived in you will be of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Come on, eh? He was, Jesus was born from above. Hallelujah. And we need to be born again from above. And when we're born again from above, we're born again with everything that Jesus had the first time he was born. Is that too easy for us? <laughs> That's about as simple as it gets. It shouldn't take 30 years to get that established. It shouldn't take three years. It shouldn't even take three months to get these most basic foundational things laid in our lives. But religion and tradition has robbed us of so much of that for so long. I went through a period of about a year. If I hear another message on identity, I think I'll scream. <laughs> not because it's not important. It's so vitally important to have that foundation laid. But come on, how many times you need to hear who you are in Christ? <laughs> do you need persuaded, convinced again and again and again? Are you so, I don't know, insecure that you need somebody to tell you again and again and again and again and again? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Peter said, you must be born again. That is so, that is the, that's the, see, what we really need right now is, we, we, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, and he's here, he's come, he will convict the world of sin. The first thing people need to be convicted of is sin. Because if you're never convicted of your sin, you'll not know that you need to be born again. You need to know when you're born again, sin's no longer an issue. Jesus already finished his work. He's already dealt with sin. Sin's already been removed, totally annihilated, gone, powerless against anybody who knows that they've been born again. I'll develop that in a minute, maybe. Jesus said, you must. It's an imperative. There's no way around this. You can't say, well, I've been a good person all my life. I never really did anything to anybody. You know, I've always blah, 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 blah. All that hocus pocus baloney that is useless and worthless and empty and void of any kind of merit with God whatsoever. You must be born again. That's it. End of story. People who are not born again are going to hell. I don't like to always bring that message in that, with that clarity, but that's the reality. Mm-hmm. Our families who are not born again, they must be born again. Our neighbours, our community, all of the people in this world who, are not, who, who do not know Jesus Christ personally as their Lord and their Saviour, they must be born again. The Holy Spirit, the first thing he does, he convicts the world of sin. Why? Because he hates people? No, because he loves people. <laughs> Because he knows that they must be born again. And then he convicts them of righteousness. And then, and then we get on to the good stuff and we get to discover the devil's had a kicking and a doing and he's, he's, a, he's a non-entity as far as we're concerned now because we're born again. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> when we are born again, we are born again with everything that Jesus was born with the first time around. Hallelujah. We're born again righteous, we're born again healed, we're born again delivered, we're born again prosperous. I'm not talking about people who go off on, off on one and that becomes a focus and how big their house or their plate are in is the most important thing in the world. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm talking about having all of your needs mm-hmm. met and not just your needs met but having an abundance policy so that you're able to meet everybody else's needs when the need arises. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. We're no longer tainted in any way by any manifestation of the curse. And just like Jesus, all we have to do is live the life. (laughs) See, we are born again as a new creation. Again, they can just be religious words. They can just be that can just be Christianese to our ears. Well, we can get a hold, we can get a grip on the reality of that. We are a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 from the Amplified puts it this way. Therefore, if any person... Are you any person here today? Mm-hmm. If you are engrafted in Christ the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old, previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. It's gone. Mm-hmm. It's dead. Behold the fresh and the new has come. The old is gone. Listen, we have a new creation life. The old is gone. I want you to hear this, and I want you to figure this out in your own, reason this through in your own mind right now. Let it come from your spirit. Either that old nature is gone or it isn't. Either, Either the new has come or it hasn't. Because you can't have both. You can't have both. Now, some people try and live as if they still have both. And that's why they fall and fail and stumble. And that's why they need to be told over and over and over again about their identity in Christ. That's why they need to be told over and over and over again how, how, how they're to get healed and blah, 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 blah. And how they run from place to place, from place to place, spend their whole lives not doing what they were supposed to be doing because it's all about moi. <laughs> it's all about me. It's all about me, Jesus. You see, that's, what the, that's the world's message. The world wants you to get the message, especially now it's been amplified to, uh, some, to some rate that your ears can barely cope with it. It's all about you. But this, it came out infiltrated the church. I, I don't know when, but it's been over a long time it's been coming in and it's getting, it's getting louder in the church. It's almost like the, the message of the gospel is all about your personal happiness. 
That's the biggest lie the church ever bought. Yeah. I'll tell you, you buy that lie, you'll never be happy. Mm-hmm. Jesus told you how to be happy. It's in Matthew chapter 5. We call it the be happy attitude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> blessed, uh, how is it putting that? It was like blessed, fortunate, to be envied, supremely blessed, happy <laughs> is the man who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Yeah. For he shall be filled. Mm-hmm. Oh, hallelujah. What's I going to do with it? some of the stuff that people are chucking around out there? Nothing. You want to be fully satisfied? You want your life to really... You want to discover what your life is really about? Then hunger and thirst after the reality of that righteousness that you've already been made in Christ Jesus, that you've already become in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the world will look at you as if you're some kind of alien, but your life will bring conviction to them. Mm -hmm. Conviction number one of sin, number two of righteousness, and number three of the judgment, because the prince of this world, Jesus said, has been judged hallelujah come on eh? what about our personal happiness that's the way to be happy hallelujah it's not about personal happiness either it's, we're here to reach the world mm-hmm. we're as saved as we're ever going to be we're as born again as we're ever going to be we're as righteous as we're ever going to be we're as healed as we're ever going to be we're as delivered as we're ever going to be we're as prosperous as we're ever going to be Hallelujah. Some of that needs to be unpacked and unfolded and let it happen. Lord, bring it on. But come on, it's not about our personal happiness, but that's the message of the world right now. Yeah. We must kick it out of the church. It's got no business in the church. Mm-hmm. It's the church of Jesus Christ, not the church of Don and Stuart and anybody else. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Come on now. <laughs> he said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell won't make any inroads against that church whatsoever. So if the gates of hell are making inroads, it's because somehow we've, we've lost the blueprint. We've mislaid the plans. Mm-hmm. We're no longer submitting to the architect. Mm-hmm. We're no longer following his design. Mm-hmm. And so what comes up ain't going to look anything like he intended it to look like. Mm-hmm. And it's going to have as little impact as that could possibly have. We have a new creation life. We need, to, we need to make that decision. Am I born again or am I not? And if I'm not, I need to get born again. Mm-hmm. Because when I'm born again, I'm not going to be the same person anymore. Amen? <laughs> if I'm not different after I'm born again, I'm not born again. If I'm doing the same things, I've got the same passions and desires and everything is still the same, I'm not born again. That's good news if you're not born again. It's good news to hear you're not born again because now you can get born again. Yeah. <laughs> Gospel's always good news. It's never bad news. It's not bad news to hear. I don't think you're born again. Well... I, that's how I know I'm not. I, I don't have the. I'm not the same person anymore. I don't run the same places with the same people doing the same things. You know, the church becomes more relevant the further it gets away from the way the world does things. The church does not become relevant when it starts to do the same things the world is doing, or has the same appetites and desires of the world. As the world becomes totally relevant and it becomes the light and the darkness when it's not light, it's not like the world at all. The less like the world the church is, the more relevant it becomes. Hallelujah. Remember, perspective is everything. <laughs> See, if we, if we try to live the new creation life from the perspective that we're still in possession of our old nature, we will just be caught up, I think I've said this already, we'll be caught up in an endless struggle. But I want you to hear this. We'll be caught up in an endless struggle with dead flesh. Yep. You know what happens? Things will get smellier. Mm-hmm. Things will become more rotten than they were before. Yeah. <laughs> we'll become more tainted with death. We're supposed to be a saver of life, the Bible says. Not tainted with death. Yep. Not carrying around that old dead man around. <laughs> Paul said, who should deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ that I have been delivered. Amen. Hallelujah. The old is gone. gone. Something dies. What do you do with that? You bury it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> as deep as you can. So the critters can't get it. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Hallelujah. We were born first time around with the nature of the first Adam. And he blew it. He didn't live the life. And so he, 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 he had a fallen and a sinful nature. He inherited a fallen and a sinful nature. He invited that in to the life that God had given him. And we were born with that same nature. But we were born again, not with the same nature. 
as the first Adam, but we were born again with the nature of the last Adam, the heavenly man, Jesus, mm-hmm. born from above. Hallelujah. We have a new nature. <laughs> the old nature has passed away, and so it must be buried. Now, I want to, let me put this. There's a process to that that can be swift if we have the right perspective. It can take a long time. It can take forever. In fact, you can never get it done. Never finally get, get free if you don't have the right perspective. But if you get the right perspective, it can be very quick. It needs to be quick because it's time for ministry. See, it's time for ministry. It's time for making disciples. It's time to get out there and make disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples. That needs to become an accelerated process. So people need to get through this process very quickly. Very quickly. It doesn't take long. It doesn't take a year, two years, three years. It doesn't have to take any of that time. It can be a process that can be over in weeks or months. Hallelujah. And we'll see this world reached. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. We'll see what the work that Jesus gave us finished. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. Strip yourselves of your former nature, put off and discard your old, unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion. This is amplified, of course. <laughs> That's step one. Imagine you've been out working all day in the, in the heat and the sun and, 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 and uh, maybe doing something ready, some, some kind of... Uh, physical work and you're sweaty and you're dirty and you've picked up all the guns and the from that, from that day's work. When you come out of the house, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to strip all that stuff, don't you? You want to get rid of all of that old stuff. What do you want to do next? You want to step into the shower. Amen? You want to wash off all of the remnants of that grime. Well, that's step two. Be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. What does that attitude do? Determines you. Altitude. And then you step out of the shower, and what do you do now? You find some fresh clothes, you put on the new nature, the regenerate self created in God's image, Godlike and true righteousness and holiness. Simple as that. Simple as ABC123. Three. <laughs> three steps, very three simple steps. You just put off the old, you have your mind renewed, and you put on the new. Hallelujah. And you never put the old one again. You ever, you, ever, you ever been out doing something like that and you think, these clothes are good for nothing anymore. I'm not even going to stick them in the wash. I'm just going to dump them. Mm-hmm. In the bin. Mm-hmm. Up with a lad. Plunk. Down with a lad. That's the end of that. They're unredeemable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you see, when, when the new nature is confronted by the opportunity to sin, it rejects it as something that is alien to it. Mm-hmm. He goes, I don't know, no, 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 no chance. <laughs> Amen? When the, when the new nature encounters symptoms of sickness or symptoms of sickness trying to get into, into its physical body, it says, no, 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 I don't, we don't do sickness anymore. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. I'm a new creation in Christ. A new creation was born again healed. I don't do this. I don't, this, this is so simple. It's, it's, it's astoundingly simple. And yet religion has confused it and made it so complex. But it's so simple. Well, I don't do that anymore. First, the first symptom shows up, saying, oh, yeah, yeah. What did Jesus say? The prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. Well, the scriptures say, as he is, so are we in this world. So we need to get this settled, folks. He has nothing in you or me. If he has nothing in Jesus, he has nothing in me. Why? Because I am now in Christ. Paul said, it's no longer I that live, it's Christ who lives in me. That's right. When sickness comes knocking on your door, let Jesus answer the door. Mm-hmm. Sickness will soon know where to go then, all right. right. <laughs> It'll bow down and say, terribly sorry, wrong house. <laughs> and you need to get next door before it does. And tell them that they can have the same result as you have in Hallelujah. Let Jesus answer their door too. Mm-hmm. Amen. <laughs> That's the good news. Glory to God. But we must, they must be born again. And when they're born again, they have a brand new nature. And with that new nature, they can let Jesus answer every call of sin or sickness or oppression or everything else. Hallelujah. We don't do depression in this house, Jesus says. We're anxious for nothing. 
We don't let anxiety or stress trouble us in the least. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> what did he say? Come and learn from me. Watch how I do it. That's why he let these guys hang out with him. He didn't show up every Sunday and say, okay guys, time for church. Mm-hmm. Peter, will you put the chairs out please? That's right. John, Mary, will you stand at the door and greet everybody as they come in? Thank you very much. That's the stuff. Yes, who's going to get the communion? What are you got? No, no, he just did life with them. That's right. <laughs> he said, come, come do life with me. I'm going to show you some things. I'm going, to see, I'm going to show you how it's done. I'm going to show you the unforced rhythms of grace. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. No stress, no anxiety, no fear, no nothing. We don't, even stormy seas don't trouble us. We speak to the sea and we tell that sea to be calm. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. We take authority. We take the back the dominion that we were created to have and to exercise from the very beginning. Hallelujah. We take it back. <laughs> Everything that comes against this new nature it recogni- that it recognizes as being alien to the new nature, it rejects, it resists. Mm-hmm. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. flee. If you want that in more uh, modern vernacular, he does a runner. Yeah. <laughs> He'll do a runner. Yeah. <laughs> He'll take off in the opposite direction. As soon as he knows, he recognizes he's at the wrong house. He's at the house of somebody who knows that they know that they know that they know. I'm getting back into foundational stuff. You don't hear this again. Surely you don't hear this again. <laughs> Hebrews 5 and the end of Hebrews 6, it says, by this time you should be teachers. Yep. Why is it that you need to hear these things again? Mm-hmm. Why, is, why is it why is, we should never have to relay the foundation mm-hmm. of and repentance from dead works and faith towards God? People say, oh, you know, I love the message of faith. I just, I just keep listening to it. Oh, oh, oh. Why did you do that? Get that foundation laid. Get it settled. God is God and he'll do whatever he said he will do and he'll do it every time. Get that settled. Hallelujah. (laughs) Let me move on to all the other good stuff. Paul said, they're just foundational things. Get them laid. Then get on with the job. You don't have to be afraid or worried or anxious about anything. Just get out there and get moving. Hallelujah. That fivefold ministry of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers... You see, they, they, they are there to initially equip us and then occasionally maybe to remind us of these spiritual realities that we're righteous, that we're healed, that we're delivered. Amen. And then again, everyone needs a wee top up or a wee, you know, a wee bit of revision or something. Revision, revision, we'll, we'll get back on track. Jeez, that's what Jesus is trying to do with his church in Sardis. He's not coming to condemn them, he's not coming to bury them. But he said, if you carry on the way, you'll be dead and you're just good, good for being buried. That's all you'll be good for. He's trying to revision them. I find your works unfinished. Mm-hmm. You've stopped short of what I gave you to do. Maybe they were having conferences every week about how we do this and how we do that and 52 steps to this and four steps to that. <laughs> Come on. Maybe they'd even set up their own Bible college where they were teaching people over and over and over again the very fundamental, foundational, basic stuff that should be settled in a week. Yep. <laughs> I, believe, I, believe, I think I said this last time, but I believe many of us in the body of Christ who have this message established in us, we have confused the beginning with the end. We, we stop at the foundation. We wrongly think that it is the end rather than the beginning. We think once you've got all this established, well, that's you. Well, we've arrived now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bless you, hallelujah. Walking in the fullness, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> does, your, does your next door neighbour even know you're a Christian? <laughs> Pardon? Hey, <laughs> anyway, hallelujah. See, I, I've discovered this. I mean, I had to go back into the, back into the, the throes of it all to discover this. But I, I, God knows what he's doing, hallelujah. And I've discovered that if you try to reach the world around you with the testimony about how awesome your foundation is, you'll tend to find that, that your witness and your testimony and your effectiveness in, in, in reaching out to these people in ministry is as low-key and as low-impact mm-hmm. as Jesus was. And you would expect that, wouldn't you? You wouldn't expect it to be better than Jesus was, would you? <laughs> As Jesus was prior to his return in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I said, I said, I've had the flu thirty years. I've never had the flu. He says, oh, well, God bless you then. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what. We try it on, my Lord. Okay, let's try it on. Ah, uh, he just, he just t- you give him all these testimonies. And I'm like, okay, here's fair to you. They need to have an encounter. That's right. <laughs> Not with your testimony or my testimony. You need to have an encounter with a living, risen Lord Jesus Christ who will convict them of sin. That they must be born again. Hallelujah. They must be born again. You know, as I was, I was meditating this other night, it kind of came to me that, that the first disciples, remember what they said, that these guys who've turned the world upside down have come here also. Now, we know, of course, they didn't really come to turn the world upside down, they came to turn it the right way up, but that was their perspective at that time, you understand. But I began to meditate and I thought, well, this is, this is what came to me. Well, the, the, the first disciples turned the world upside down or the right way up or the right side up because their lives were turned inside out. Yeah. That's how they were so impactful in turning the world the right way up was because their lives were turned inside out. How many Christians live their lives outside in? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Or inside, inside, or whatever it is. I don't know, inside. I don't know. Anyway. It's, it's wrong way around, anyway. <laughs> it's all about me, Jesus. It's all about my personal happiness. It's all about me having everything the way it's supposed to be. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> See, on the day of Pentecost, that's what the Holy Spirit did. It turned the church inside out. Remember just not long before that they were, they were meeting together in, in, in private because they were afraid of the Jews. Jesus tells them to wait in that upper room until they're endued with power from on high because then they will be witnesses to him. And what happened when the day, when the, day of when the Holy Spirit came and settled upon them as tongues of not as fluttery little white doves no as tongues of fire on each one of them. And they all began to speak with tongues and to prophesy. They weren't saying Oh, Sister Mary, you sound so wonderful. Oh, God's got a great plan for your life. Get out of here with that rubbish. <laughs> they were proclaiming and declaring the kingdom of God. God's heart. Hallelujah. And where did they end up? Having another wee cosy fellowship koinonia meeting? No, no, they were. Didn't they get a dose of the koinonia? No, no, glory to God. They were back on the street where they were meant to be. Yeah. Hallelujah. Where Jesus kicked it off. And everybody got to hear the good news of the kingdom in their own language in a way that they could understand it. And some rejected it and some accepted it. And that's just the way it's going to be, I'm afraid. Some accepted it and some rejected it. And the ones that accepted it said, what must we do to be saved? What would we have to do? Come on, tell me. I can't stand another minute of this feeling that I'm feeling. Help me through that. Peter preached the gospel to them. Told them exactly. He went right back to the cross. He preached the cross. We preach Christ and him crucified. Crucified for sin. Crucified as the, as the only one who is able to reconcile us to God. The only mediator between God and man. The only one who is able to accomplish salvation. None of your good works and none of your pathetic Pleadings with God about how wonderful you've been. You must be born again. Now we know there's some people who are better than others, who appear to live better lives. Well, that's true, that's right. But we don't measure each other against each other. If you want to measure yourself against sin, you measure yourself against the cross. Yeah. And, note, and know that if you'd even only ever committed one sin, told one little, what you might want to call a white lie or anything else, then that cross was necessary for you to be reconciled with God. That's it. And the power of the Holy Spirit came on the church. They were turned inside out. And because they allowed their lives to be turned inside out, they turned the world the right way up. They began to have an impact on the world around them and they began to spread exponentially across the known world. Hallelujah. Because they did not, it says in Revelation 12, 11, because they did not even love their own lives, even unto the death. Hallelujah. 
That's what the power of the Holy Spirit did on the day of Pentecost, and that is what the power of the Holy Spirit still does. Where did the Holy Spirit first take Jesus when he came out of the wilderness? Straight into the lion's den. It wasn't supposed to be the lion's den. It was supposed to be his home environment. But it turned out to be the lion's den. <laughs> Maybe that happened to you the first time you, when you got born again. You went home and you raced home and, you, and there was somebody you wanted to tell. Remember, yes, I've just met Jesus. And they said, get out of here or you'll be off the next cliff. <laughs> you might not be prepared for that. <laughs> 